Hello, welcome everyone on what is unfortunately quite a dreary and grey Tuesday afternoon in Auckland. And you are joining us just to confirm for the MyHR Live 15th, which is on drug and alcohol testing. Um, so thank you for making time this afternoon to hang out with us. Um, it's quite a hot button topic today, so I just want to confirm at the start that we won't be debating um, the use of drugs or alcohol in your private life. What we will be talking on is managing the risk from alcohol and drug use in the workplace. So if you have thoughts or opinions about drug use in your private life, um, please save those to the cannabis referendum that will be coming with the 2020 election next year. As always, there is a bit of housekeeping. Feel free to ask questions as we go through. We welcome your questions. They're a really important uh, point of discussion for us. Um, we'll answer them at the end. And of course, you can always email us at info at myhr.co.nz as well. Uh, the video will be available on our YouTube channel afterwards and we'll share it on Facebook and LinkedIn and those kinds of places. So if you miss out or if you have technical difficulties, the video will be available afterwards. Uh, this does mean though that if you do have questions, they will be captured in the video. So please make sure that there aren't any um, identifying details and don't use real names and that kind of thing because they will be visible afterwards. So in terms of what we'll be talking about today, and sorry, my A4 has gone a bit uh, wobbly on me, we'll be talking about the context and the legislation that back drug testing in the workplace. We'll talk about effective drug and alcohol policies and what they look like. We'll talk about managing your workforce appropriately, and then the uh, more pressing point of what to do when someone shows up intoxicated or what to do when someone shows up under the influence and what you can do from there. So uh, we'll start off by talking about the context and the legislation. So there is a well-established principle in New Zealand, both in legislation, so law made by the government, and in case law, which is law made by judges, that you are entitled to have a private life and you don't have to have every single decision in your private life uh, signed off on or, or overviewed by the employer or, or by the government. So that's a pretty well-established principle. Um, off the back of that though, the you still have to meet your health and safety obligations at work. So if you are behaving in a way that is dangerous or if you are behaving in a way that may affect your work life, then that's where your employer can step in. And drug and alcohol use is one of the um, behaviours in your private life that has a high risk for, for overflowing into your work life and it's something your employer might choose to manage. So what governs this overlap between your personal life and your work life in the context of drug and alcohol use and testing is the Health and Safety at Work Act. Um, we won't go into it into a lot of detail, but the basic principles are that you as an employee have obligations about looking after your own health and safety, um, which means that you are keeping an eye out for yourself being well as well as your colleagues and any other workers on site. And it also means that your employer has obligations towards you, towards other workers, to make sure that everyone is, is safe and, and can work safely at work, basically. Um, and that these obligations are proactive. They aren't just about being reactive, it's about making sure that at work everyone is keeping an eye out for health and safety, so it's a, a fence at the top of the cliff rather than an ambulance at the bottom kind of approach. So we're talking about drugs and we're talking about drug use and I wanted to highlight some statistics which um, inform this kind of discussion and which inform the need for policies that are humane but also appropriate for managing those health and safety risks. So. We'll kick off. 67.5% of New Zealanders are employed, so that's two in every three New Zealanders has a job. Um, half of New Zealanders aged 15 to 65 has tried cannabis before, most commonly in the form of marijuana. And one in six define themselves as regular users of cannabis or marijuana, so one in six. 1.1% of adults have used amphetamines in the last year, so you'll see that amphetamine usage is, is vastly lower than cannabis usage is, which um, I think is quite a good thing. Around 20% of the population drink hazardously, and hazardously means um, in a pattern that puts the person at risk of physical or mental harm. So it's not a glass of wine with dinner, something like 95% of adults have drunk alcohol in the last year, but it's 20% of the population drink in a way that puts themselves at risk of physical or mental harm. 16.3% of New Zealanders are current smokers, which is defined as smoking once a month or more. Um, and tobacco, as we know, or we all should know, is a legal drug, but there are health consequences from consuming it um, in the form of tobacco. Last couple of points, one in 37 New Zealanders has tried ecstasy in the last 12 months, so that's just below, I'm not even gonna try and do the math, I think it's just below 3%. Um, so it's not as high as cannabis, but it is higher than amphetamines. 
Um, and there is also a personal referendum, or sorry, a referendum on the personal use of cannabis coming next year. So the Justice Minister, Minister Andrew Little has said that as part of the general election next year, there will be a referendum on the personal use of cannabis and you can vote yes or no. Um, they have said it's going to be a binding referendum, but I think more details will come out in the next little while about how that's going to be managed. So there's a lot of talk about that in the media at the moment, which contributes to this being um, quite a good topic for discussion for our Facebook lives. So those drug and alcohol use rates indicate that there are a lot of people who have jobs, 67%, um, and a lot of people who are drinking or um, smoking marijuana or imbibing cannabis or, or, or smoking. Um, so how do we manage the balance between the private life and your work life? How do we manage those risks there? And um, the HR answer, of course, is having effective drug and alcohol policies. So um, most businesses will have either written or unwritten, if you're a small business, policies about the use of drugs um, and the consumption of alcohol at work or in relation to work. And this is really important, particularly in safety sensitive environments. So if you are a driver, if you're in um, a high risk industry like logging, if you are working with heavy machinery, if you're tr moving around customer sites or heavy equipment, then it's really, really important that you are safe at work. And those environments are much more likely to have a drug and alcohol policy because of the risk factors. So um, a good policy will effectively manage risk to your business. It will outline the consequences of breaching the policy, which will often include um, being intoxicated or under the influence at work. Um, it's regularly implemented and it is enforced in your business. So those are really, really critical. Um, it will also have, also have a reference to testing. Um, it doesn't need to, you can still test without it in your policy, as you'll see later on. But a good drug and alcohol policy um, should definitely have testing in there to make it really, really clear what the boundaries are and what the catalysts are for engaging in drug and alcohol testing. So um, if you don't already have a policy in place, you want to think about whether you need one, especially if you have safety sensitive roles. Again, if you work in a safety sensitive industry, you should have one of these already. Um, you also want to think about what type of testing regime you want to have in place, if any, if you want to have random drug testing or just testing uh, where there are grounds to believe someone might be under the influence. Um, and also whether you want to have a zero tolerance policy or take it on a case by case basis. And we'll talk about that a bit more in a second. So in terms of your options for testing, like I said, a good policy will include content about testing. And there are three broad categories of drug and alcohol testing. So the first is post-incident testing. So this is where someone has, um, uh, you know, touch wood, um, hit someone with a forklift, where they have crashed a car, where they have dropped pallets on the warehouse floor. Something has happened, which means that you want to test that person to make sure that they weren't impaired at work. Um, and that's pretty common. You can test without having that in your policy. But again, so that everyone's on the same page, we would recommend including that um, in any drug and alcohol policy that you have. So the second type of testing is reasonable cause testing. Again, you can test for this without having it in your policy anywhere. And that would be where someone shows up to work, um, is slurring, maybe is fumbling and dropping stuff. Um, they might smell of alcohol or marijuana, um, or they might be, um, yeah, have red eyes, be taking lots of breaks for snacks. Um, so where you see someone behaving in a way that gives you reasonable grounds to think that they might be under the influence, you can test them in that context. Um, and the last one, of course, is random testing. So random testing is where you, on a regular basis, will bring in drug and alcohol assessments into the workplace. It's not because something has happened, but it's because you typically work in a safety sensitive environment and you want to be proactive about making sure that people in your business aren't under the influence. So there is a regular testing program um, to support their compliance with your drug and alcohol policies. So those are the three different um, grounds that you can test for drug and alcohol on. The, having talked about testing, the worst case scenario, and I really want to emphasize this, is having a drug and alcohol policy that isn't enforced or isn't implemented. Um, and this tends to happen, and we see this happen, where businesses have um, a zero tolerance policy. So they say if there is any alcohol or any illicit substances in your system when you're tested, that is grounds for serious misconduct and you may be dismissed. So no matter if it's a very small amount of, of marijuana from a joint you smoked at a party a couple of weekends back, whether it's a very, very small amount of ecstasy um, from a party that you went to over the weekend and you're now not affected, but you might have been, um, those policies make it really, really clear what the consequences are, but 
what it means is that if you are in a workplace where you know that some of your people probably have been smoking marijuana or where they probably have got substances in, the, in their system, um, your line managers may end up choosing not to implement your testing program or not to test anyone because they knew if they had to test their workforce, they'd have to get rid of half their people. So um, they test no one and then they miss employees who are a genuine risk factor, which means you're not managing your health and safety risks. So if you do have a zero tolerance approach, you need to be prepared to manage to that approach um, and you need to be mindful and in tune with the type of workforce that you have and the type of people in your business because if you are choosing not to test as much as you think you should because you don't want to have to fire employees of yours who are otherwise good workers but maybe had you know, again smoked a joint or um, yeah smoked from a bong over the weekend um, it means that you aren't managing those employees who are a genuine risk and it means that you are um, potentially opening yourself up to, to some risky situations there. So um, the reason we get calls most often and the thing that we talk about a lot with our clients is what happened when someone does show up to work looking intoxicated um, and that would come under the reasonable cause testing that I mentioned earlier. So um, if there's not an incident, you don't have a random drug testing program in place, but someone is behaving in a way that makes you think they might be under the influence. So you can immediately take them for a drug test. There are different providers around the country. If you're a larger organization, you probably have a relationship with a provider, that's cool. Um, they will then, the employee will then be asked to submit to a urine test. Um, and if it comes back with a negative result, that's fine, it's a negative result. You probably need to have um, a different conversation with your employee about why they're behaving badly. But if it's a non-negative result, meaning there are trace amounts of a particular substance in their system, those that urine sample will be sent to a lab for further analysis and the lab results will come back with um, a really accurate evaluation of what level of trace substances will be in that person's system. So you've taken them for a drug test. We'll talk about the outcomes from a negative test in a second because it's pretty obvious what those outcomes are. But if they have a non-negative result, um, depending on what your company policy is, if it's a very, very, very minor amount and you don't think there is a risk of them uh, causing trouble or being a health and safety risk to themselves or to others on site, you can allow them back to work. Most people tend not to because the reason they've tested them is because they were behaving badly or behaving oddly in a way that made them think there might be something wrong. Um, at that point in time, we often advise suspending on pay so that you can get them off site, send them home to recover, um, and then wait for the disciplinary process to follow in terms of a warning or dismissal for serious misconduct. So just to recap that, if someone shows up to work and they appear to be intoxicated, you can test them immediately whether that's in your policies and your agreements or whether it's not because it's governed by your health and safety obligations. If they show up with a non-negative result after they've been tested, our advice is to suspend them from work on pay to get them out and to manage the immediate risk to your business. And then you can kick off that disciplinary process um, once you've got the results from the lab back. So it is a bit of a process, um, but it means that you're managing the immediate risk of them being on site. So, you have a negative test, so you've taken them for a testing because they looked like they were behaving oddly or they were stumbling or dropping things and they've come back with a negative test. So at that point in time, there's no drugs in their system that you can tell. Um, you definitely want to be having a different conversation with them about what's going on. So that might be a conversation to the effect of, this behavior is quite concerning, what's your explanation, what's happened? Um, and if they are on um, certain types of medication that can have um, behavioral balance and grip effects like diabetes medication can, I believe. So if they have just changed meds, that might be one of the reasons they're behaving oddly. Um, if they didn't get a lot of sleep the night before, there's basically an unlimited realm of, of reasons why someone might be behaving a bit oddly um, that may not be drug related. So just bear in mind that even if someone is behaving in a strange way, it may not be because they're on drugs. Um, if you had a, not, a negative test result after an incident testing or after a random drug testing, again, there's nothing you need to do there. Something triggered the reason for the drug test, but it wasn't that they were behaving ran weirdly. There was a car crash or someone dropped something or there was um, a, a random drug test scheme in place. So at that point, you can just move on. That's pretty typical. Um, however, if you have a result that is non-negative or that comes back positive um, with the details of the trace amounts of the substance in that person's system. Remember that the purpose of drug testing is to keep people safe at work. It is not to punish people for choices they've made in their personal life. It is to make sure you are keeping them safe and healthy at work and that you're keeping other members of your team safe and healthy at work. So 
Health and safety is taken seriously in New Zealand, which means that a failed drug test is usually grounds for dismissal based on serious misconduct. But I want to be really clear that you cannot instantly dismiss someone. In no context in New Zealand can you instantly fire someone. There is no misdemeanor or no bad behavior so great that it voids their right to kind of fair process and to having their side of the story heard. So if someone does have a positive drug test result, again, you cannot instantly dismiss them. That is illegal. It is very against the law. What you need to do is remove them from the site through that suspension piece I mentioned earlier, and then run a normal disciplinary uh, process where there is a chance for them to give their side of the story. Having said that, dismissal may not always be the best or the fairest option because again, it's not about punishment, it's about managing risk at work. So you need to carefully consider the following questions before deciding dismissal is the most appropriate outcome. What does your policy say? You're obliged to go with what your policy says, so if it is a zero tolerance piece, you need to comply with that. Um, if your policy doesn't make a comment and it gives you the discretion to decide on what to do with someone, questions to ask are, what was the actual risk here? What, what prompted the test? Was it unreasonable cause? Was it random drug testing? Was it post-incident? How high were the levels of um, THC, which is the active ingredient in cannabis, um, of amphetamines or alcohol? What, what was the actual likelihood of there being an incident here? And then what explanation did the employee give you? So did their explanation line up with the trace amounts? Are they saying that they um, only smoked a joint you know, two or three weeks ago, but the levels in their system indicate um, really recent or habitual usage? Does the, did they say that it was just a one-off use of ecstasy at a friend's party and now they have lower amounts? Make sure that you're, you're talking to them and getting their account for why these substances are in their system. Um, if the employee wasn't intoxicated or under the influence at work, so say it's come up through a random drug testing scheme, and provides you with a reasonable explanation for the levels in their system, then you will not be able to make a connection between the choices in their private life and risk at work, or between the choices in their private life and undermining your trust and confidence in them. Where you can't make that connection, where their choices in their private life did not overlap with their work life, and so there's no crossover where there might have been risk, Dismissing is a significant risk to the business because it's not considered to be what a fair and reasonable employer would do. So be really, really careful if you are dismissing when that connection's not there. And of course, call us and we can talk about it and advise you of the risks from there. So if you choose not to dismiss the employee, either because you have um, the gray area to, to decide, you've got some discretion there, or because the trace amounts weren't significant enough that you don't think the risk is there, um, you now have someone in your business who has um, either turned up a positive test result or who has disclosed to you that they have a substance abuse problem or that they have issues with drug and alcohol. So like any behavioral problem, whether they were having difficulty with their computer literacy, whether they were having issues with their time management and getting work done on time, you're now obliged to support them and to make sure that things go well for them, um, but only within the bounds of your resources. So this might include um, paying for them to go to rehabilitation. It might include supporting them with time off to attend Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics anonymous meetings. Um, you could agree to an ongoing random drug testing scheme just for that person if it's not commonplace in your business to help them comply with your expectations um, and organizing regular meetings to catch up is often a good, a good piece as well to make sure that they feel supported. So a large a number of large organizations we work with do have policies about rehabilitation, but they're large employers. They have lots of resources at their disposal and smaller businesses don't always have the time, um, the money or the specialist knowledge or access to specialist knowledge because of time and money um, to help contribute to a positive rehabilitation experience. So it's not that you have to rehabilitate them, but you have to look at the bounds of what would be reasonable for you to, to deliver as an employer and support them within those bounds. So it's that fair and reasonable standard again. Um, this doesn't mean that you can't dismiss them if their behavior continues to be a problem. So if they fail a drug test, um, if they're in another incident, if they continue to show up late and under the influence or, or hungover and really struggling to do their duties, you absolutely can dismiss them on, that on those grounds. Um, but you can't sit on your hands and do nothing to support them once you know that they've failed a drug test or they've disclosed that they have a substance abuse issue. Um, it's not reasonable. You as an employee need to work with them to help them um, because otherwise they're basically a ticking time bomb and it will, be, um, it will reflect on you badly that you didn't proactively manage the risk to your business having decided to keep them in the business. 
So that's it in terms of formal content today. That was um, a really quick fire round through the content that I wanted to cover off. So thank you for your time. Um, I'm just looking up to see if we've got questions or comments and we don't at the moment. So thank you again for your time. Uh, the video will go up on YouTube and on Facebook and LinkedIn and we'll share it around. If you do have any comments, put them on the video afterwards and I'll be checking in to make sure that nothing is going on there. Otherwise, have a lovely, lovely afternoon and a safe rest of your week. Thanks for watching. Thank you.